Welcome, brothers and sisters, to another uh, program uh, sponsored by the Real Talk Show. I want to thank Brother Jay for giving CCBE uh, the opportunity to express his views and concerns on the, the Real Talk Show. Uh, I am Takuna Milana El Shabazz, and I am president of CCBE. For those of you who may not be familiar with CCBE, let me share just a synopsis as to what we're about. CCBE, or the Conscientious Council of Black Elders, is a network of progressive, multi-talented, resourceful, and conscientious black men and women who value the concept of self-determination. As an independent community-based organization and advocacy group, out of Lafayette, Louisiana, we are committed to advising, counseling, producing, and or researching available resources, resources for the purpose of building, representing, and protecting the collective interests of the black community. Our central focus involved, but is not limited to improving the pathway for upward mobility and equity in black communities, which includes politics, economics, corrective education, social value, history, and culture by any means necessary. To begin today's show and program, I have prepared an open statement, a press release, in which I want to share with you, the public, the viewing audience, that that might serve as a suitable background or backdrop for us to engage in a constructive dialogue this afternoon. This is a call-in show, and the information in order for you to call in will be made available uh, to you, uh, the viewing audience, uh, at the appropriate time. Now for the open letter that I believe will address some pointed issues and concerns in the community that I hope to, again, engage the public in a meaningful dialogue. The press conference interest of, that was captured is entitled, A Solution for the Pollution in the Black Community. It is not the most productive idea to boast of splashing on the best of perfume or cologne while bathing in a cesspool. In nearly every instance, the alluring pleasant scent of the perfume or cologne will be overpowered by the aggressive stench coming out of the cesspool. It is unreasonable to conclude otherwise. Another metaphor to, emphasize my, to emphasize my point might be, you cannot enter a jackass in a quarter race and be surprised and upset if it doesn't win. The pollution in the black community exists in many and multiforms such as police terror and brutality, miseducation or no education, economic exploitation and oppression, culture genocide, historical blindness or disconnect, political disenfranchisement, social underdevelopment, and religious misguidance. One or combination of these pollutants are always cited as causal determinants for violence, lack of economic productivity, ineffective group response, and the overall destructive act of self-hatred that are manifested in many other forms. At least, this is the standard rhetoric that spews from the mouth of most of our pretend leaders and organizational heads, both political and religious. Usually, after their perceived analytical deduction of the problems, what commonly follows are the profound solution of nothingness. The above 
describe rhetoric. To most, it's obvious to most, but, persist, but it is persistently ignored. It is ignored because it is too challenging to call it for what it really is, the effect of white supremacy on a socially engineered, oppressed black people. Consequently, to pray to one of the conceptualized version of a white Jesus registering more black people to vote to have the right to vote for nobody, attending visuals after a killing, marching around the neighborhood block for a month, singing beautiful spirituals, and calling out for more false integration to achieve an illusion of unity are old, ineffective, antiquated methods in combating the oppressive forces of white supremacy. So what are the viable solutions for the pollution, for the pollutants in the black community? There are no exclusive methodology in addressing the multitudes of concern. However, what must be common to all approaches is a commitment to nation building based on the knowledge of self. Our time is being wasted. The repair and restoration of the neglected, exploited black community must embark on a complete systematic infrastructure undertaking for real change. That means the core of the social, educational, political, economic, cultural, and spiritual institution in black community must be owned and controlled by the people who will impact, who will be impacted by their functions. It further means where there are existed, existing underserved and ineffective institutions, we must make them effective or abolish them. Where there are the non-existence of needed institution, a laser focus should be on creating those institutions by any means necessary. This is expected and a normal behavior of any civilized people. The present, the persistent expectation that someone else will or must do this for us is an elevated expression of modern day slave behavior. Black people's reality will not change with superficial talk about reparation while putting more emphasis and more emphasis and value on our earned degrees and the, multi, and the multiple skill sets we acquire at white institutions or so-called black institutions that mandate the Eurocentric standard of education as a good education. It is nothing less than mind-blowing for me to have experienced a disproportionate number of skilled black men and women with a vast array of talent who lack the appetite for nation building for black people. Some vehemently oppose the concept outright while simultaneously utilize their skills and talent to build and secure a nation for another people. Unfortunately, the fact that most black people and other people of color that are poor, marginalized, disenfranchised, and treated as second-class citizens seem to have very little influence on the thought processes of those blacks who reject the concept of nation building. On the other hand, nation building cultivates self-determination. That's Kuji Chagalia. Unity, that's Umojo. Collective work and responsibility, that's Ujima. Cooperative economics, that's Ujima. Establishes purpose, that's Nia. Releases our creativity, that's Kumba. And secures our faith in the creator and in one another, that's Imani. Under the influence of a rich, black, African-centered principles, under under, under the rich black and African-centered principles, there is a greater propensity for black people to seek self-governance 
under the guidance of an ancient African system of ma'at, truth, righteousness, justice, and reciprocity. It is far better for black people to endure the growing pains of self-governance with all its initial flaws than to be satisfied with being governed by a hypocritical system of white supremacy. Hypocritical systems of white, suprem white supremacy thrive off the interests of racist individuals that occasionally issue out tokens of humanity when it is economically and politically expedient to secure the interests of those who subscribe to white supremacy. Some modern-day slave-thinking black people will be quick to argue that all white people are not racist. Even if that is so, what is true and what has always been true is that most white people, directly or indirectly, have been benefactors of a white supremacist system. I don't see too many of them volunteering to give up their privileged position to do the right thing. The institution of education is the only profession that every other profession is predicated on. Consequently, our views of the world are directly related to the scope of education we claim or have been denied. It is often said knowledge is power, not necessarily so. It is power only if inf the information given to produce the knowledge is truthful and relevant to reality. If the paradigm, if the parad uh, paradigm of thought are to be changed in black communities, we must make teaching our own children paramount. For the past two years, I, along with others, have been quietly working to do just that. The building of one school in our community will not solve all concerns. However, our children are the best place to start. We must commit as a people to restore the truth of self in our children so that they might forge a new reality for their people in the future. Racism is not an individual, but a system that racist individuals seek to thrive. We must build systems that reflect the best in us as black people to shield us from the damaging effects of institutionalized racism. Brothers and sisters, that is my open statement that I am seeking to set as a background, as a point of emphasis, to engage in constructive dialogue with the potential callers that are viewing this program. I want to point out a few more things. I believe that the number to call in will be flashing on the screen uh, pretty soon, so be patient. But we need to discuss a few more points. In my opening statement, I discussed the concept of white supremacy. Many of us, most of us, have heard this term expressed in one way or another. However, given my experience in the black community and with many of us in meetings and in organizational efforts, I am not quite sure we understand the full meaning of the word white supremacy or its effect and impact. Therefore, I'm going to try to bring down that understanding to a level in which those of you who are viewing this program will have no doubt what white supremacy is, or another way of saying it, white control. When we discuss white supremacy, we believe that white supremacy shows itself only in extreme cases. When we see the brutal killing of a Michael Brown, when we see the brutal 
slaying of uh, Tamir Rice, uh, 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 Victor White, Eric Garner, Alan Sterling, and the like. When we see white cops on film shooting seem to be unprovoked black men, then the word white supremacy or injustice or racism pops up into our head. And we see this for what it is. And certainly that is an extreme form of white supremacy. But white supremacy we are dealing with every day on many different levels and many of us do not realize that we are supporting tenets of white supremacy. We are white supremacists in our action while we speak opposite of what we say we represent. For instance, white supremacy is in your name. White supremacy is in your food. White supremacy is in your dress. White supremacy is in your understanding and acceptance of God. Every time a black person make an argument in defense of their European name without proper knowledge, you are feeding into the tenets of white supremacy. Every time you argue about religious issues, trying to defend some version of the white man's God, that's feeding into white supremacy. Whenever you do not take the time and think that you can eat whatever you want to eat, and you do not know your own diet as a black and African person, and that you believe that soul food is the best thing than sliced bread, then a liking of your history make you eat foolishly, and it feeds into white supremacy. Why? Because your inability to eat properly, you don't think properly, you don't feel as you should. Soul food has killed more black people than any other disease that you might cause and that you might recognize. We have a tendency to eat food because of its taste, not because of its quantity or quality. We have a tendency to think like we have been conditioned by white supremacy to think. You are an advocate of white supremacy. When you shun or feel uncomfortable with brothers and sisters who might dress in the ancestral attire. Check yourself out. Most of you that I know that believe that you are black, you are too uncomfortable in many cases to wear your African ancestral attire, not because you view it as unattractive, but you do not wear it because you could not explain it to your white coworker. You could not explain it to your white boss. You could not explain it to your children. Many of you who reject your black and African self daily and have accepted a European definition of yourself in many aspects, you are supporting and promoting the concept of white supremacy. It is the effect of white supremacy that you represent. Therefore, there is a constant gauging that takes place in the black community by those who promote and support white supremacy is that if you're too far from engaging into the practice of white supremacy as a black person, then you become a troublemaker. Then you become an element in the community that is not accepted by white people. Therefore, because of your white supremacist mind, many in the black community shun black people who are not accepted by white people, who do not represent or support or advocate the tenets of white supremacy. When we as a people understand the nature of our history, the nature of our being, 
when we understand the melanated black man and woman being the mothers and fathers of civilization, we understand that to be not a light statement, but a matter of fact that causes a white supremacist mind to tremble at the reality of us accepting that and acting out of that on the basis of truth. To denounce the history and the culture of another people does not make you anti that person. If you look on your screen, you will see one of the biggest symbolic white supremacist symbols that we are practicing in this community, which is used as a litmus test by white people to see how progressive black people are. On the screen, you will see a black man tied to a tree being branded by the white supremacists with a branding iron, the fleur de lis. The fleur de lis is a French term, but it makes reference to an African flower, an African flower that the Europeans fell in love with, transported to Europe, and used it in so many different ways in their society, even to the point where they made a branding iron out of the fleur de leaf to mark their slaves. Now I know some of you recently have attended a lecture, I believe it was at the university here, where I need to keep that screen up there for a while, where the discussion in detail of the fleur de lis were being revealed by a white professor a professor who spoke of the history and the historical accounts of how this fleur de lis should not be acceptable to black people, should not go unanswered to black people. Yet, the University of UL uses this symbol boldly and brassly as a symbol of joy to acknowledge their history and their proudness in their so-called Cajun culture. What does that mean for us? What does that mean really for our history? The fleur de lis is a symbol in which black slaves were marked and branded, branded by the French to secure their property in the event that person were to run away or was rented out, or whether that person was acting in such a way in which there had to be proper identification and designation that that slave belonged to that particular white French group. Now today, they want to tell you that the fleur de lis is just a symbol of joy. They want to tell you today that the Fleur de Lis, even though this is the history of the Fleur de Lis, we fall prey to the reality that white folks have taken our understanding of ourselves and our history and wiped it completely away from our minds. Therefore, we are used as marketing tools to manifest self-hatred among our own people and among ourselves. Some argue and say, well, the fleur de lis is an African flower. We're from Africa, so you say. And I say, yes. And the fleur de lis is a beautiful flower. And as a flower, it should be acceptable to us as a people, as one of God's creation. But to not understand how the fleur de lis was contaminated, made, and used in history, it's just childlike in your understanding of history. For instance, let me share this example with you. I don't think that most of us would be threatened by a simple rope. However, 
A rope cannot be discredited as having many multiple uses. But when someone takes a rope and they structure it into a hangsman noose, then that rope becomes not just a rope, but it becomes a symbol of the tool of slavery that was used to kill and brutalize black people. So when I see a rope, I don't necessarily thinking that white folks gonna hang me, but if you take that rope and you craft it into a hangsman noose, that's a historical message that black folks should always reject and always rebel against. So when you show me a fleur de lis flower, I can love it and appreciate it as one of the African flowers from the mother country. But when you take the fleur de lis and you put it in the form of a branding iron and you use it to brand the backs of black people, then it becomes a symbol of slavery that we should reject in this area. But now, how can white folks participate in making you and get you to participate in using you as a model machine to market your own disrespect, your own degradation, and what they've done to you. They keep you ignorant to your history. So I wanted you to look at the screen, and you will see that a branding iron in the form of a fleur de lis. That branding iron was put on the backs of many of your mothers and fathers and grandmothers and many black Africans that we are unaware of. That's a symbol of torture. That's a symbol of slavery. That's a symbol of disrespect. So now today, because we are lacking in the history of ourselves and our sojourn here in America, the white man doesn't have to use his branding iron to put the fleur de lis on you. We put it on ourselves. We put it on ourselves and we try to rationalize and tell ourselves, well, I, 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 I didn't know, so I'm going to reverse the meaning and I'm going to make it a positive thing. How are you going to remake, how are you going to take a, a rope noose and make it a positive thing? How are you going to take the symbol of the fleur de lis in the form of a branding iron that burned the the skin off of black people and make it something positive. No, that's not what you're doing. You see, you're operating out of ignorance, ignorance of yourself, ignorance of your history, and you're operating in a manner in which you want to make sure that you are sending a signal to your white oppressors, the formulators and the orchestrators of white supremacy that you are ignorant to yourself, therefore, you're not a threat to white people. You're not a threat to white supremacy. And they will allow you to exist. Matter of fact, you would actually get benefits in this racist white supremacist society for denying and hating yourself. This is how serious this fleur de lis is. Now, I want to make one more point on that that I want you to clearly understand. The fleur de lis was used to mock black people as the owner of a particular slave owner. UL, with its raging Cajun mascot, a logo that they know historically represents the concept of Cajun being the equal and unequivocal slur word as nigger. That's a historical fact. That's a historical reality. Now, how white people and what white people choose to call themselves is not my issue. I really have no concern as to what white folks choose to call themselves. What I do have concern with is that when white folks take a derogatory word that represented them in their history, a gutter word that they made for themselves, and then suddenly decide, decide they're going to clean it up and then brand black people with it, a word that was equivalent to the word nigger. 
So now, the modern day white supremacists, the modern day slave masters, today said, okay, what we're going to do is that we're going to see how many black folks will tolerate us renaming them, rebranding them in this modern day and make them generate the monies in order to do it. How are we gonna do this, white people? How you decided you're gonna do this? You decided that you were going to create a mascot, Raging Cajun, which is insulting and objectionable and at the very least insensitive to the historical reality of black people. And you label black people, black athletes, your university, and then you promote every and anything of worth in Southwest Louisiana as Raging Cajun. And then you say, let's see how many Negroes that we have in our camp that we don't have to worry about those few who might know the truth. What are we, well, what's your plan, white man? What are you gonna do now? Well, I'm gonna bring down the fleur de lis and we're gonna brand them again. So they rebrand you. They don't put the brand on your back today. They don't use the hot iron to brand you. They brand your mind. They put the fleur de lis in your community and everywhere you go. And we believe that the fleur de lis is something good. And the white man knows when he looks at you and he looks at you personally, he looks at your organization and he looks at how you handle and how you use the fleur de lis, he knows he's got his Negroes under control. He knows that's his. So black folks from Southwest Louisiana who go around calling themselves anything else other than black and African, he knows he's got you because he knows you're gonna sport the fleur de lis. He knows that you're gonna sport the Raging Cajun t-shirt. He knows that you're not gonna to organize to, to make real the reality of what UL is doing to us economically, politically, culturally with this Raging Cajun propaganda. He knows that you're not gonna join the fight for culture genocide. He knows that you will not oppose it because he has branded your mind as a modern day slave. Look at me, look at me. You ain't got nothing to worry about me. Look, I got the fleur de lis on my own. I put it on my chest. Many of us are unaware of that historical reality. However, in this community which cannot go unaddressed. There's a movement, if we want to refer to that, to move the racist statues in the New Orleans area and it began to matriculate throughout some of the southern states. So white folks that are real white supremacists who have some seat of power are frantically working behind the scenes to create laws to make it difficult to have those statues removed. And I believe that those statues should be removed. I do not quibble with that reality, with that fact. However, in New Orleans, where the statues are being moved and have been moved, here in Lafayette, where the Alfred Mouton statue is being challenged to be removed. And again, I agree that the statues should be removed. My problem is, is that removing the statues is not enough. The removal of the statues, although is a good thing, is a sick thing as well to remove the statues of racist symbols throughout the South without changing the mindset of black people does not prove to be effective or will provide any meaningful change in the black community. So we have leaders who say, like the statue you see here, the Alfred Mouton statue, 
got to go, it's got to go out. But culture genocide is okay. I've said in a meeting with Mr. Greg Davis, who is the so-called black man that is director of what is insultingly called the so-called Cajun Dome, which I make reference to often as the nigger dome on Nigger Boulevard. Mr. Davis took positions with those who opposed the Alfred Mouton statue as a racist symbol that has no place in this society, has no place in this community, and it should be removed. But Mr. Davis does not see the branding of black folks' mind and soul for this raging Cajun issue and don't believe that is a relevant issue. He do not believe that the raging Cajun and the symbol of the fleur de lis is a symbol of racism that perpetuates ignorance and self-hatred among black people for themselves. So the stature is out, but culture genocide is okay. Brothers and sisters, that is the kind of challenge that we face throughout our struggle as black people. The compromise has been over the years for black people who are challenged by white people because of the raging Cajun and the fleur de lis and, and the promotion of it and the, how they have intertwined it into the economic survival of black people, which is economic and cultural terrorism. No less than that. That's economic terrorism. You got black people who will tell you in a minute they live in Acadiana but can't even use the word Africa or won't even use the word ancestral connection to the African people. They won't use the terminologies that ties them into Africa because they're from Acadiana. Brothers and sisters, the compromise has been for black people to accept themselves as Creoles. Creole is a word that white folks gave us in our sojourn here in America that was under French and Portugal control to identify their slaves who were the offspring of their sexual exploit of black women and black girls. <laughs> Let's, let's go to the phone lines. Carly, you on the air. Uh, great show, my brother. Thank Listen, you, sir. Uh, I know time is winding down fast for you. You got so much good information you're providing. One of the things I want to ask you bro about, Brother Dakota, was uh, recently the Louisiana Legislative Caucus uh, recently walked out over an issue with the general legislative body over the issue of removing the monuments in the state of Louisiana. They was passing a bill, the majority of the legislative uh, body put forward a bill to ban local municipalities and local government from removing the statues. Now, while we, we applaud the move of the legislative caucus, black caucus, to, to walk out, my issue is that they should have been doing that in a number of other prominent issue over Alton Sterling, police accountability, police reform, prison reform, and so forth. Uh, I'd like to get your take on, on that. Uh, you, uh, how do you feel about more uh, from our legislative uh, members, more symbolism over substance uh, as far as uh, relief to all these uh, major issues that affect the black community in the state of Louisiana? And the other issue, and I'm going to try to keep it brief, is uh, the controversy over Bill Maher's statement about the use of the N-word, and I hope we could say it on this show, the, the nigger word has been used uh, across this country uh, since uh, day one, since our ancestors got here from Africa, uh, the use by the black community of the N-word and the use of uh, by those who would use uh, that for a uh, symbolism uh, to practice racism. Tell us how you feel about that because it's, it's prominent in the news right now. So I
questions. Uh, first, let's deal with the legislators, and I, I want to, again, um, uh, be to the point so that we can cover as much as we possibly can. Um, Brother, I, I, I think that action that you described speaks directly to the point in which I'm making today, and that is, uh, I think you used the phrase uh, uh, symbolism, symbolism over substance. Well, that's exactly what it is. Um, would the Black Caucus, maybe they would, maybe they would not, but would the Black Caucus have taken such a position if a white mayor was not for uh, abandoning or removing those statues? Uh, those statues have not been put up there last week. I mean, it's, it's been years. Um, although I applaud them for, for doing so, um, I would have preferred, I would have preferred the Black Caucus rattling black people also around the unjust concerns and issues that are taking place around the killing of black people, especially young black men, especially the, the situation in, uh, in Baton Rouge itself uh, with Alton Sterling. I would prefer the Black Caucus walking out because of the injustice, perhaps, that is being directed there and making themselves more visible for those principal issues, because the killing of those black men is the manifestation of the mindset of those who put those statues there in the first place. So if you're going to deal with real substance, then you want to deal not with the not with a, in a reactionary way to white supremacy, but you want to deal with the core cause of white supremacy and begin to eradicate it at that point. Now, uh, I, 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 again, I certainly applaud them for, for doing so. I just wish they had broadened their scope and their efforts in terms of standing up for more substantive issues that's already blatant and in, right in front of them. Uh, on your second question, in terms of um, uh, I, I, I believe in reference to uh, the, um, let, let me take this call, it's going to come back to me. Caller, you're on the air. Yes, I wanted to see uh, an outstanding program. Thank you so much, Brother Takuna. Uh, Thank you, I wanted sister. to, uh, your book that you uh, wrote, Black I Am, Cajun or Creole, I'm not, it's, it's a conversation piece uh, because like I have it at home. Oh, I have two copies at home, but it's a conversation piece. And I was just uh, wondering, could you just please elaborate for a, a, a few minutes about this, this, this Creole, I'm really, really black, and, and this Cajun stuff, just briefly, uh, sir. Uh, thank you so very much. All right. Thank you, sister, for that call and question. Uh, the second question of the first caller, he spoke to the issue of uh, the comment made by uh, Bill Moore, the uh, radio person, uh, television personality, and his use of the N word in reference to a, uh, an interview that he was doing with one of his guests, and he made mention of the fact that uh, this person is going to provide some type of uh, uh, energy to employ uh, certain people. Uh, in Nebraska area, certain black folks in, in that area. So in, in a, in a uh, comical way, um, the, uh, I think the gesture was made that there would be jobs that would be created that would be related to agriculture where people would be working in the fields. And uh, Bill Maher's response was, no, that, that wouldn't work for me. I'm not going to work in the field. I'm a house, uh, uh, I'm a house Negro, well, a uh, house nigger. And uh, so that was a big reaction. Certainly, I, I, I don't appreciate and, ex and, and accept that from Bill Maher or any, or any other white person, but I believe that uh, uh, it was done in a, in a comical way for, for reasons which was not necessarily funny to me and not funny to most black folks. And it just goes to show that even the most liberal ones or perceived liberal ones among us uh, do have concepts and, and ideas that sometimes they express innocently that is not so innocent to us. So uh, I can think of a lot more uh, individuals uh, that don't use the N-word that I would spend energy going after rather than uh, Bill Maher. Uh, but I, I, I do appreciate those and, and I'm one of those who object to the idea of him using that. But I understand it, too, in the comical way in which he presented it. It was just in poor taste. 
Now, as far as the book is concerned, in the book, Black I Am, Cajun Creole, I Am Not. Um, Creole is a, 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 a word that white folks want us to be defined the, by so that we can accept a position of second-class citizenship. And that's what it is. It makes you a second-class citizen. It makes you proud that you want to be cousins to Cajuns. And what that really means is that uh, Creole is not really even a, a, a culture or a history. It is an experience in which black folks temporarily went through, uh, brings you back maybe two to three hundred years of exploitation uh, by the French people. Now, that in itself is real. We can't deny that, that reality. But is it our culture? How could we change, exchange 300 years or 200 years of exploitation by our uh, French uh, uh, people and exchange that for 76 trillion years as the original people of the earth and say one is our culture and one is not, or one has more importance than the other one not. Uh, little do people know, Cajun people didn't make us, whether we like it or not. You can't be the mothers and fathers of civilization not on white people too. White folks were made by us. So the original black man and black woman is the mother and father of civilization. So any white person who whatever ethnic group they claim they belong to, you set your history long enough, is going to take you right back to that black man and that black woman. So Creole is a trick word that has been given to us. Creole in the form of uh, the, in the minds of the Portuguese that actually produced that term, they have a term that is called uh, Creola. That term Creola means Creole, but it means one whose slave was born in the house. So what you got when you call yourself a Creole? You're calling yourself a modern day house Negro. That's what you are. And to advocate Creoleism as some form of proudful, historical, cultural experience for us, as though somebody got to give us a culture and give us the history, all you got to do is be strong enough and accept your beautiful black and African history. And when you accept that, you embrace and identify and accept every other people's history on the face of the earth. But because of white supremacy, we have been bombarded with the concept of Creole, and many of us today are Creoles, and we have so many different definitions. Creole represents some light-skinned black, uh, uh, black offsprings, basically in the New Orleans area and Pearl River. And when you get into talking with these folks who call themselves Creoles, you got a totally different perspective in terms of what some of us want to say, I'm a black Creole. Some, you, can't even, you can't even put your foot on the property of some of these Creoles who call themselves Creoles and of light skin. Some of them say they, they Creole because they, they mix with white and Indian. Some of them say they mix with uh, uh, African American and whites and Indian. Some of them say we ain't got no uh, 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 black blood in us at all. Some of them take the position, uh, I'm just Creole. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a unique breed of people. I, 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 have, I have no connection to anybody else. I'm just a unique breed. The foolishness in the, in, in, in that, that goes on into this Creole circle, and for some of us, some of them are politicians, some of them, matter of fact, uh, Mr. Vincent Pierre, one of our politicians is pushing this Creole concept. Uh, the NAACP is having one of the biggest Creole advocate, uh, advocators for the annual uh, fundraising banquet. You have, uh, well, that's not surprising, the NAACP, the National Association of Colored People, they haven't reconciled with the proper identity of themselves as a black people. You know, and that, that's another show and that's another issue. But the point is, is that some of our so-called leaders, some of our so-called uh, uh, best minds in the community have bought into this Creole thing for, so say, for the purpose of creating some economics and creating a position where they can be cousins to Cajuns and be proud. Yet they embrace the, the uh, 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 fleur de lis symbol, you know, and that's another way. Creole is just another way of branding black people to be foolish about themselves. And I hope to the caller that represents uh, a proper answer for your question. I, I, I want to, before time runs out, I want to bring in another startling contradiction. Um, uh, we are right upon uh, the point in which we are going to be celebrating one of the most important holidays uh, of the year for black people, and that is Juneteenth. 
Um, many of us still don't know what Juneteenth is all about, but soon you mentioned the 4th of July, all of us get ready to, you know, to, to, to bring out the barbecue grill and, 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 and get our mouth all greasy with pork chops and boudin and, 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 and the foolishness. But most of us don't know what Juneteenth is all about. So there's an, there's an effort to try to bring people into the light of Juneteenth. However, again, as in the past, uh, I have been disappointed with that effort, not because I question the intent of the persons who were organizing, because of the persons who are organizing are not fully abreast of their own history, and they make mockery in their good intent. Whether someone slaps you purposely or slaps you accidentally, that has nothing to do with the sting. And I believe that many of our people are lacking in a proper history and understanding of themselves, and we are used through that ignorance to make mockery of ourselves. If you look at the Juneteenth celebration, a beautiful celebration as it appears to be, I'm not sure whether you can see it on the screen, but the emblem that is being run by, by, uh, to promote Juneteenth celebration has the fleur de lis right in the middle of it. You see, what does that say to black people? A day of independence, a day in which Juneteenth uh, it's supposed to be a day of independence, a day of freedom. You are still bringing with you the slave master's brand to show that you still are calm, unaggressive, well-behaved, uh, unintrusive Negro. And that's what you're doing. That's what you're teaching our children, you see? And if you look at the bottom of that flyer, if you can't see it on the screen, then get one. And look at the bottom of the flyer. And look who sponsors. Look at some of the sponsors of Juneteenth. And you will see certainly there will be a few sincere black folks involved. But you will see most of the European and their corporations that are sponsoring Juneteenth. So how much freedom will your slave master actually finance for you to have? So the concepts and the idea of Juneteenth is real. The purpose of Juneteenth is real in terms of what we should be doing. But do we understand how to celebrate it? We just embrace the whole idea of colonialism and, and, as we celebrate. Now, for the 4th of July, right quick, or the 4th of July, many of us don't understand the concept of separation. So we get all excited when we say, listen, these people are not going to treat us right. They don't teach us right, so they're not going to treat us right. So we need to separate from them. And some of us get all bent out of shape every time someone talks about the concept of separation. Well, the 4th of July, you, sep you are celebrating the separation of white folks from another group of white people. That's what you're celebrating. But you can't celebrate Juneteenth because you don't know nothing about Juneteenth. You don't know nothing about the 4th of July either because they get you to buy all the liquor and all the meat and, and get you to act a fool in the park. And you celebrate economically and make white folks rich and make white folks rich with the idea of celebrating the 4th of July. And in actuality, you are celebrating their separation from a group of white people. This is what the 13 little colonies was all about. That's what the Revolutionary War was all about. We fought in that war. And we call it the 4th of July because the British said, you, you fight for us and they'll give us our independence and we're going to set you free, slaves. The uh, Southern Americans said, the 13 little colonies said, look, you help us fight. We go, if we win the war, we're going to set you free, slaves. Well, Britain done a little better. The Brit, Brit, uh, British people lost the war. American uh, uh, 13 little colonies won the war. And we've been launched back into slavery, not knee deep, but neck deep. So this is what we celebrate. But we don't want to. We don't want to at any time to talk about the concept of separation as though you're not separated. Let me just say this as we close, because we have just a few minutes left. How do you figure you're not separated? Don't you know Lafayette has just received the cleanest city award and, and, and the happiest city award? Well, I question that. I question that. Seriously. I'm sure they didn't take into account black folks on the north side of town. I'm sure they did not look at the economic, political, and social condition of black people when that decision was actually made. So what makes you think you're not already separated? The only problem is you don't want to accept the fact that you are politically, economically, socially, and spiritually separated into a realm of ignorance in which you're left to manifest your own self-hatred and to keep your own communities and your own cultural awareness to a level where you will never lift yourself out of that condition. And make no beans about it, brother and sisters.
you will not advance until you accept fully the truth of your history and your culture. That is the key to your economic success. That is the key to your educational success. That is the key to your political power. And white folks know it. But the system of white supremacy is so slick. All they got to do is give you a fleur de lis and give you a free ticket to UL basketball game. And you think that everything is all right. How ignorant we have been made. How wise we must become. So in closing, brothers and sisters, let me remind you that if you were black and African yesterday, you are certainly black and African today. And unless you do something unnatural to yourself, you will be black and African tomorrow. So love and embrace your beautiful black and African self.